Welcome to another edition of ProSoft Technology Video Training. Today we'll be covering the process of the first time setup and configuration for the PLX51 Data Logger Plus 232. The Data Logger Plus 232 is designed to help users get a comprehensive view of any issues in equipment before heading on site to troubleshoot. By seeing performance history, the true nature of problems can be determined and the time needed to diagnose an issue is greatly reduced. The PLX51 Data Logger Plus 232 is also the first ProSoft module to support REST API, allowing for a third-party interface to use custom scripts for automated data collection and export to other software or systems. With integrated support for REST API, the Data Logger Plus is an ITOT connector, making it easy for OT to provide the process data that IT needs for IIoT applications. Today, we'll be covering downloading and installing ProSoft PLX50 configuration utility software, the general setup for the Data Logger Plus 232, and then configuring two log tags from a Logix controller. We'll take an introductory look at the REST API feature, allowing the retrieval of module status and tag data in JSON form. And finally, we'll see how to access and view the recorded data through the PLX51 Data Logger Plus's built-in web server. So let's begin. The first thing that we need to do is download and install ProSoft PLX50 configuration utility software from the ProSoft Technology website. This is a free application that is used to configure the PLX51 module and will allow you to do all the necessary configurations and mapping to make the module an integral and useful part of your program. Once we have the files downloaded, install PLX50 configuration utility to your PC by following the prompts. When it's done, we'll open up the configuration utility and create a new project. The first time you connect the Data Logger Plus module to your network, you'll need to launch the DHCP server and assign it an IP address on your subnet. Now, in order for this to work, you need to take care not to connect the gateway to a network with its own DHCP server, although that can work and we'll get to that in a little bit. So you click this button here in the menu bar and there is our gateway. So click Assign and on the window that opens, I'll enter an IP address that I know is available on the local network. Select Enable Static and click OK. Now the bar should turn green, letting you know that the gateway has been assigned the IP address and is now connected. And we can close this window. Next, right click on New Project under the Project Explorer and select Add. On the Add New Device window, I'll select DLP 232 Data Logger. We then come to the main configuration window. Now, as you can see, we have five tabs at the top. The general and serial tabs encompass the basic configuration for the gateway, and the other tabs will only be enabled depending on what data source you select. So on the general tab, you give the gateway an instance name and a description if you like. You then enter the IP address. Now you can either type in the address manually or you can click the browse button to the right of the field to bring up the target browser where you can see all the devices on your network and just select your PLX51 module. This will be the address that you use to access the module and it'll be the address that you just assigned to it a minute ago. If you already have a DHCP server on the same subnet as the IP that you want to assign the module, you can just let it assign an address to the Data Logger Plus. Then simply right click the Data Logger Plus here in the target browser and select Port Configuration to set a static address. Next, we come to the data source selector. From the drop down menu, we can select what sort of device that we want to log data from a Logix controller, a DF1 device, and a Modbus RTU or TCP IP device. Now, for this training session, I'm going to log data from a Compact Logix controller, so I'll select Logix. We also have two logging modes hold and overwrite. You're basically selecting what you want the PLX51 to do in the event that its database 
of more than 16,700,000 tags fills up. Hold tells it to stop logging new data and just hold on to what it has until the records are downloaded and cleared. Overwrite will instruct it to go back and begin overwriting the oldest log data with new data. It depends on how you plan to use the PLX51 Data Logger Plus and the data that it collects. For this demo, I'll select Overwrite. Moving on, the Serial tab only needs to be configured if you'll be logging data for the DF1 or Modbus RTU sources. At the top, we have the basic serial network configuration settings, and below there is a section specifically for the DF1 network settings. The Logic Source, DF1 Source, and Modbus Source tabs are for logging data from those respective devices. I have a Compact Logix processor that I will be logging data from, so I'll configure the Logix tab. Depending on which source you choose, the other two tabs will be disabled. I'll start by giving the controller a name, something that might help me keep track of what I'm connecting to. I can then click the Browse button to browse devices on the subnet. I'll locate my controller and select my processor. The IP address along with the slot number will appear in the controller path field. Now I can now click the Browse Tags button to pick the tags from the controller that I want to log in the PLX51. I have some tags in the Compact Logix that will change at different rates over time to illustrate the data logger's features. So I'll just check them, click Select, and then OK, and they'll appear down in the Logix tag section. Now from here we have some options to define how often and under what conditions we want to log values from each of the tags. On the right we have the three parameters to configure when data should be logged. The first two, the delta y and minimum time, work in conjunction with each other to ensure tags are not logged too frequently. The last one is the maximum time between logs. Delta Y is a simple value change. So if we leave it at one, anytime the value for the tag changes by one, up or down, it will be ready to log the tag, and it would then wait for the minimum time interval between logs to elapse before logging the tag. Time units here are in seconds, so if you set this to the minimum of one second between logs, you could log data for a tag once every second, provided the tag value kept changing at least one every second. Unless you're monitoring something where every little change is critical, you don't really want to do that. If the variable that you're monitoring is something that changes rarely, or if it's a binary, you might leave the change value at 1. If it's something that changes more often or is more volatile, you might increase it to 10, 100, or whatever would be a significant enough change that it would be worth logging for your application. You can also use minimum time interval to meter how often logs are collected. So the final parameter here is the maximum time between logs, and by default we have it set to 3,600 seconds, or one hour. At which time, it will log the data for the tag even if nothing has changed. Over on the left, we have the group member and trigger fields. This is a way of connecting multiple tags together. So if one tag value is logged, it will automatically log data for one or more other tags as well. So I can use the frequency and timing features to set up when to log data for each of these tags independently, but another approach is to use the group feature to ensure that all the important data that I might need for a particular event gets logged at the same time. So you set a trigger for the group, and this could be a machine or system turning on or off. So power status tag is trigger A, and then all pertinent machine data tags would be members of group A, and this could include temperature, voltage, uptime, etc. So in the event that the machine turns off or goes into standby mode, it will trigger logs for all of these other tags as well at the same time. You can have up to eight different trigger or member groups. Once everything is set up to your satisfaction, click Apply to save the configuration settings. And while you're at it, you should probably save your project at this point. We can now download our configuration to the PLX51.
So just right click on data logger over in the Project Explorer window and select download. Once the download completes, you'll automatically go online and begin logging data. Now, as you can see, we have several new entries that appear in the Explorer view. Double click on status and a new window will open. We have many tabs that show all sorts of data about what the PLX51 is up to. We'll return to this once we've actually connected to the Compaq Logix. For the next step, we'll switch over to RS Links, where we will use the Data Logger Plus's built in EDS file. Now, this isn't necessary to talk to the Logix processor or to log tags from it, but it will allow our controller, as well as the rest of the Rockwell software ecosystem to recognize our gateway. To do this, we simply open up RS Links, expand Ethernet IP, locate our gateway, and it will appear as an unidentified device with the IP address that we assign. Right click on it and select Upload EDS from Device. Then just follow the prompts to complete the EDS upload. And if you find that you don't have the option to upload the EDS file, you should try restarting RS Links. Sometimes RS Links doesn't recognize that an EDS file is available. Once you've completed the upload and RS Links can identify the PLX51, you'll see that it now has its own little icon. We can now move into RS Logics, where I already have a project set up. I'll set my project to run mode and the tags that I'm monitoring with the Data Logger Plus will begin incrementing through a range of values. Now I should be able to return to the configuration utility, open up the module status, and see that data is in fact being logged. The tag status tab will show a live stream of the data readings of your tags as they're being logged. The recent records tab shows a list of the last eight logs, and it will refresh as newer logs come in. And finally, we have the record management tab where we have options of what to do with all the log data. We can upload all log data to a CSV file, only the unread data, or we can actually erase the stored data. If we choose to upload, the resulting file will display the logs like this. Another option we have to access our log data is by using the Data Logger Plus's Representational State Transfer or REST Application Programming Interface. This is an industry standard method of calling customizable programming interfaces on a remote server. This gives you unparalleled access and control to the records, tags, and status information within the data logger on a nearly unlimited assortment of platforms and programming languages. The Data Logger Plus supports specific APIs for maintaining and accessing data contained within the Data Logger. These include general status, cache statistics, unload log index update, cache records, reset log indexes, get tag names, get tag database, get trend data, and get cache records. For more in-depth information about each of the available API functions and their parameters, along with some sample scripts, please refer to the PLX51 Data Logger Plus User Manual. All APIs used by the PLX51 are communicated in JavaScript Object Notation, or JSON, making the API calls easily accessible from any programming language or software package. We will demonstrate using a sample client program that we use for internal testing that serves as just a little sample of what you can do using the REST API functions. Now, in the near future, you will be able to download scripts from the Data Logger Plus product page that will allow you to access the module's REST API features. For now, you can use the software of your choice, whatever supports JSON. So, via the REST APIs, we can read status data and the client will collect the current module and status data from the Data Logger Plus. We can read all tags and a window will open with all the tags being logged. It's also possible to keep track of the communication history with the Data Logger Plus. 
And since all of the APIs respond with the data in JSON form, it's easy to manipulate the data in your programming language of choice, along with literally hundreds of popular scripting languages and SCADA packages that support JSON data. Finally, we can also check out the Data Logger Plus's web server by opening a browser and entering the module's IP address. This will open right to the module's overview page, where again we have the data about the module and its status. There are other pages with specific types of information, the Ethernet connection, event logs for the module, we have diagnostics, We'll go down to Report, where we can grab data logs for up to five tags at a time and generate a graphic report for them. So I'll use the drop-down menus at the top to select each of my five tags. Each one will be assigned a color. Now, just click Retrieve Trend Data, and you should get a graph something like this. Now, if not, it might be because you need to wait for whatever time range you have selected to elapse before a trend can be recorded. Now, this is not a live feed. It's just a snapshot of the past few minutes worth of log data. Each dot on this graph represents a data point at the time of capture. And from here, you can see the value of each tag over time, as well as where logs are being recorded. You can also click the Save All Events button to generate a spreadsheet with all the values and times of log data for these tags. And that should do it. If all the configuration information was entered properly, your PLX51 Data Logger Plus 232 should be logging the selected tags from your Logix processor. If you have any questions or would like more information about the PLX51 Data Logger Plus, Use the link in the description to go to its product page, or feel free to give us a call. Until next time, happy training.